Hello everyone. Today is Thursday the 28th of May. I was speaking to my friend and neighbour, the Methodist minister, recently. I told him that sadly there was material I was going to have to share more widely. You see, I had been watching the Methodist cat. And not to put too fine a point on it, that cat has recently been on what can only be described as a murderous rampage. Just after church, the Sunday before last, Hannah and I watched as this predator injured a bird in the manse garden before flicking it under the fence. Back home on Methodist turf, well, it did what cats do. As we say, it played with the injured bird until the little bundle of feathers neither tried to escape any more, nor flapped, nor twitched. I've got to say that a few years earlier, Hannah would have been round to the Methodist garden to save the bird and perhaps berate the Methodist minister for not training the cat in good Francis of Assisi style. When Hannah was growing up and I was called to deal with really huge spiders, she would follow me all the way from her bedroom to the back door to make sure nothing had happened to the spider on its way to release into the wild. Then, get this, a few days after the first incident with the psychotic Methodist cat, I was washing the dishes. Suddenly, said cat appeared on the grass not six feet away from me. It had another bird, dead this time, which it proceeded to claw the feathers out of before eating as much of the victim as it wanted. After that, it just sauntered off, leaving the remains. We can romanticise and idealise nature. But as these two little incidents in their way remind us, nature and indeed life can be harsh and can be cruel and can be touched by tragedy. But somewhere deep in their dreaming and in their imagining and in their envisioning, the ancient Israelites intuited and sensed and understood that this is not the way things are supposed to be. Out of this they devised or added depth to the word shalom, which you can see above me. It is normally just translated as peace. But this hardly does justice to the depth and range of the term. For along with that core definition of peace, it carries connotations and hints and associations and suggestions of so much more. It is like a rich blend of different flavours of meaning coming together. These include harmony, wholeness, wellness, completeness, prosperity, welfare, tranquility, and the sense of being valued. So when Isaiah poetically envisages wolves living with lambs, leopards lying down with goats, cows and bears getting along together, and children, little children, playing with dangerous snakes, that's a glimpse of shalom. It says there's hope for the Methodist cat yet. And when Micah holds up the vision of warriors beating swords into plowshares and spears into pruning hooks so that everyone can live in contentment under their own vine and fig tree, that's a glimpse of shalom too. The way things could be in the world. In an attempt to encapsulate as much of the term as possible, one thinker has said that shalom is this. It is the webbing together of God, humans and all creation in justice, fulfilment and delight. We call it peace, but it means far more than mere peace of mind or a ceasefire between enemies. Shalom means universal flourishing, wholeness and delight, a rich state of affairs in which natural needs are satisfied 
and natural gifts fruitfully employed, a state of affairs that inspires joyful wonder as the Creator and Saviour opens doors and welcomes the created ones in whom the Lord delights. Shalom, in other words, is the way things ought to be. In light of that, and in the midst of all that is currently hurt and wrong in the world, and all that is in need of healing, let me say shalom. Shalom to those who are anxious and worried. Shalom to all who have been so severely affected by coronavirus and so badly let down by government. Shalom to those in our own congregation who have lost a loved one and have experienced the deeply unsatisfactory nature of funerals in these times. Shalom to our friends David and Rachel. David and I met more than 30 years ago. He was getting ready to go to El Salvador and I was getting ready to go to Malawi. Our families, as they came into being, became friends, Betsy and Rachel, and then the children. Nathan and Alice, David and Rachel's eldest daughter, are the same age. David and Rachel's younger daughter, Lucia, comes between Hannah and Rose. Lucia needed her first liver transplant when she was eight. She needed her second a year later, almost to the day. After her third, she flourished and lived so fully with joy and purpose. Life had fully returned and we had never seen her look better. The future seemed bright and brilliant. Lucia set up Live Loudly, Donate Proudly to raise awareness of organ donation. She engaged with local politicians on the issue, including Joanne Dobson. She swam in the transplant games. She spoke with great wisdom to our Impact Youth Group about her journey and its struggles. The whole family worshipped with us in Banside. Last autumn, it became apparent that Lucia needed a fourth transplant. That operation began on New Year's Eve, but recovery afterwards was hard and never really happened. We got word last Sunday afternoon that Lucia had died that morning. Today was her 21st birthday. This was not the way it was supposed to be. So shalom to David and Rachel and Alice. Shalom in all situations of aching hurt and brokenness as we travel to the time when everything that is wrong will be put right and the kingdom will have come and God will be all in all and the tear will be wiped from every eye. Shalom until we meet to worship on Sunday. God bless.